Good afternoon and welcome to Midday Live from the news up here at Adisa Wakanda in Accra. I am Wendy Lai. The headlines for this afternoon. <music> Reprisal attacks in Lukula in the North Gonja district of the Savannah region. We'll update you. And on the firing front, 63 people killed in a bomb explosion at a wedding hall in the Afghan capital, Kabul. I've got the details of these stories, including sports and entertainment, coming up shortly. Let's start with our stories now. And heavily armed men on motorbikes on Saturday evening were reported to have launched reprisal attacks in Lukula, a farming community in the North Gonja district of the Savannah region. According to locals in the area, the armed men bent down dozens of houses and chased residents into the bush. The incident on Friday was reportedly triggered by a misunderstanding over a control construction of a mosque between the Gonjas and the Mampusis in the area. Two persons were confirmed dead as at Saturday in Lukula. Four persons also sustained various degrees of wounds. Gonjas and Mampusis have had misunderstandings over who owns Lukula in the recent past. Now the situation led to the Yabongura sending a delegation led by the Savannah Regional Minister Adam Salifu Barra to meet with the Nairi to agree on a roadmap to settle the Lukula issue. Meanwhile, reports indicate too the town has been deserted by and security has also been beefed up in the area. Well, shortly I will be joined by Northern Regional Correspondent Christopher Amwako to give us updates on this very story. Hello, Christopher. Hello, Wendy. Now, what's the latest development in Lukula? Yes, the latest development as we speak in Nikula is that the town has been deserted uh, after uh, gunmen uh, attacked the uh, community yesterday at about 7.30 uh, p.m. Uh, the gunmen are uh, reportedly from uh, the Daboya area who went uh, to Lukula and burned down several um, houses in the area. Now, we're told that security was beefed up as of Saturday morning. What's the situation now? And where were the security personnel when the incident happened? Yes, so uh, earlier um, when the incident happened the next day, the Savannah Regional Minister, Honorable Adam Salifu uh, Brahma, uh, together with some RECSEC members, uh, visited the community to uh, um, ensure that calm re has returned to the uh, community. And after they left that uh, morning, that was Saturday morning, in the evening, uh, there was this uh, repressile attack from uh, gunmen uh, uh, suspected to be from the Daboya area. But the issue is that according to the assemblyman of the area, um, one Wasa Osman, that when the minister visited the area, the chief assured uh, him that there was no going to be any attack again. So they left with all the security personnel uh, he went there with. Unfortunately, uh, in the evening, the incident happened. So according to the assemblyman, there was no security personnel. No police officer was left behind when the minister and his team left the place. And after they left, when he suspected that there would be uh, another attack, he called the D.C. for Daboya uh, uh, um, district, uh, North Gonja district in Daboya, to send uh, police officers to ensure that uh, there is total peace. Unfortunately, uh, the uh, um, D.C. didn't re respond to his calls and, and, and the, um, the attack happened again in the evening. All right, now, Christopher, in your earlier report, you did mention that the town has still been deserted. You also brought us some updates early on and said that the residents had fled to the bush. Are they still there or they've dispersed to other communities? That's As if you have that. Right update. now, the, the, the community is deserted. As we speak right now, the community is deserted. But you can't tell where exactly these residents have gone to. You know, Lukula is surrounded by um, a lot of communities. So some of them, according to the assemblyman, are believed to be in the adjoining communities. Others, the Mumpris, you know, that area is dominated by Mumpris. So he's saying that most of them have fled to Waluwali and other uh, Mumpris-dominated uh, big towns. 
All right. Well, thank you so much for that update, Christopher. So bring you more updates on that. And as it stands, heavily armed men on motorbikes on Saturday evening were reported to have launched reprisal attacks in Lukula, a farming community in the North Gonja district of the Savannah region. According to the locals in the area, the armed men burned down dozens of houses and chased residents into the bush. Now, the incident was reportedly triggered by a misunderstanding over the construction of a mox between the Gunjas and the Mampusis in the area. And two persons were confirmed dead as at Saturday in Lukula. Four persons also sustained various degrees of wounds. Gunjas and Mampusis have had a misunderstanding over who owns Lukula in the recent past. And the situation has led to the Yabunra sending a delegation led by the Savannah Regional Minister Adam Salifu Berman. I'm told that we do have him on the phone lines. Hello, sir, and thanks for agreeing to speak with us. Yeah, good afternoon. Now, we just spoke to our correspondent, and he also told us that um, the town is still deserted. Can you tell us what exactly is being done to ensure that the security and peace in that community? Uh, it's not true that the town is still deserted. The people have started going back. It's an unfortunate situation. When did they start and going the, back? The security on the ground. Of, uh, uh, a combined team of military and police. They are on the ground now. So now when the did the residents start going back to the community? They started going back last night as we were moving. We met some of them. Some of them started going. Uh, early dawn today. So are uh, they all back yeah. or just some of them are back there? No, some of them. Well, you know, when these things happen, it takes time to be, to, to, for people to get the confidence to go back. Uh, but the police are doing everything to restore calm and peace. So as it stands, are there still security officers in Lukula? Yes, there are a combined team of military and police at Lukula, yes. Now, as a chairman of RECSEC, how are you going to use your office to address the conflict between the two factions there? Oh, this one is, uh, uh, we, we're calling emergency RECSEC meeting. For, uh, it involves the two regions, Northeast and uh, Savannah region. So we're calling a RECSEC meeting to see how we can, and to get the two uh, traditional chiefs, the Yabura and the Nairi involved. This one, it, it, it was, a conflict with uh, among the Mapuches, but it's still over to involving Gonjas now. So there are two ethnic uh, groups involved. So we have to be very, very sensitive about what is going on. So when are you calling the meeting, and how quickly do you intend dealing with this problem? Oh no, as quickly as possible. We are looking at Wednesday for the recent meeting because people have been invited to come for the meeting. But uh, the issue is a developmental challenge. TV3, I'm throwing a challenge to you. It's not a question of just reporting this mishap that happened, people fighting. If you come and see the, the road network there, that's what is causing all these problems. So uh, we are throwing a challenge. Next time we are going there, you join us and you see the terrain and the difficult situation that we, the people, are in. It's a question of poverty. Now, you're, you're saying that this meeting will be held on Wednesday. Is that not too far? Today is Sunday, we have Monday, we have Tuesday. Before we, you have that meeting on Wednesday, won't residents there be worried? And you mentioned that some of them are there. We're also told that um, the security men left there after you, your visit. So two questions. Isn't Wednesday too far? Why is that meeting going to be held on a Wednesday? Why not today or even tomorrow? And we're told that the security men also left there after your visit. That is not, I'm telling you, the security men are right there. That one thing is not a question of just listening to what people say. You people should be on the ground. Well, we heard that from our reporter, not people. Yes, that one I'm saying, we should go to your reporters. We were there. The security men are there right now. And calling the meeting, yeah, these are the two regions. People have been invited for meetings. And the bit about Wednesday, why drag them, why wait till Wednesday before you have that meeting? Is there a challenge? It's not a challenge. It's calling people for a meeting. You understand? And we are also talking to the Interior Minister and the National Security to get as men on the ground to come and relate the, those people who are already there now. It's a city challenge you are facing. The men to be on the ground. 
So is, is, is that to say, just for clarity's sake, now you're saying that you're calling people for the meeting. Is that that they are not willing to come to the table to have discussions to end this problem? Or you're just having a difficulty not gathering them together? I'm telling you, it's not a question that they are not willing. You are inviting, they are coming, some of them are coming from Accra, far and near. And this, uh, this, uh, the logistical challenges in getting people to meet. You have to take their this travel distance into consideration. Yeah. But right. right now, as you are saying, that everything is calm now. We have men, both militaries, uh, military and police, on the ground. We are maintaining the peace. And nobody will be allowed to disturb the peace again. All right, well, thank you so much for your time. I've been speaking to the Savannah Regional Minister. I'll bring you updates on that story as well in a subsequent bulletin. You're still watching Midday Live. And about 10 families have deserted their homes while close to 200 residents are taking steps to relocate owing to the unbearable smoke billowing from the Bone Landfill sites. The site has been in flames for the past 18 hours. However, the fire service says it would take more than two weeks to put out the place. My colleague Josephine Frimpong was there yesterday. How I see how the smoke is, it's, not, it's too bad. So, me, as for me, I'm planning for tomorrow, I'll leave this house plus my kids and go to either village or anywhere I'll, I'll have fine to have a decent peace. Because of the kiddies. And then it two days. Madam Yentimi, a mammy tea, Macuma, it's me, Home. To them crown and no mean pee, I deny them in a tea, you name me a bear and crammer. It is too much bad. Miss Menium, Menium, Timmy, no more sign, Miss Timmy, a bias is no problem when any, and to a boy, a son and any yapo cross, and I know a sign of Boba, and to a mind Timmy Clay, any ducla, yet did deny it to send tonight, Timmy DB. This is the reason why residents who live quite close to the landfill site are forced to relocate. Some have already relocated and others are preparing to move. Well, the fire service have been struggling for the past 24 hours to put out the fire, but it's been one struggle onto another. According to them, it will take more than two weeks for them to douse the flame on the landfill site. We understand that uh, this particular kind of fire might be on for about two weeks. Can you tell us what actually might have caused this kind of fire? But I'm suspecting probable causes that we have on these things is that sometimes this the rubbish they generate heat themselves and where the heat is generated if there are combustibles there and they have a little oxygen supporting them it ignites. You understand? Apart from that people do it deliberate burning People do it themselves to take out whatever they want, copper wires and metals out of them. If the metal is in a, a plastic sort of thing, you have to burn it down and then take over whatever they want. Ah. We'll bring you more updates on that story as well. And privacy remains a challenge as 13 teachers posted to the Kramok Krom Roman Catholic Basic School in the Doma East District of the Bono region share two rooms. Now, authorities say the issue is widespread in the district. Education in the Doma East District has been decentralized to serve people, especially those in the hinterlands who could not trek for hours to access education in the district capital. The Kremokrom School is one of such learning institutions. Pupils from more than four adjoining communities come to acquire formal basic education here and so 13 teachers comprising three females and 10 males have been posted there to render tuition. But accommodation is inadequate. Two rooms provided by the Parents Teacher Association is what accommodates all the teachers. One has been allotted to the female teachers while the remainder houses the men. To the teachers, privacy is a worry. Of a privacy matters, I can't talk about it now, but since we have a um, desire to teach and we have the, the love for the students, we are still living here to do the work. Interestingly, the accommodation has no bathroom, so the open space is the only alternative. Half of bath house, we stand outside to bath, and the ladies too, we all stand outside to bath. 
room rental also comes with challenges. In villages, uh, uh, people build their houses according to the number of people in the in the in, in the house. Uh, for instance, uh, if I am the husband and I have one wife, three children, I'll build just two rooms. I am my wife will occupy one and the rest of my children will occupy one. So if you are I mean a stranger and you are coming in, how do you get a place uh, nice for you to sleep? Two years ago, the community assured the teachers of providing extra accommodation for them, but that is yet to materialize. Doma East District Education Director Joseph Amwamensa finds the condition of the teachers pathetic. The schools out there you send teachers there, yes, they have to go, but you look at the conditions and so many other things, and sometimes when you're so strict on them, you yourself, you don't even have the moral grounds to do that because uh, they don't even get rooms to hide. And teachers who have just come up from school or on reposting, how do you expect them to build their own houses within the, the constraints of time? And they don't even know the terrain very well. This is not the only challenge facing the school. The makeshift structure accommodating kindergarten pupils has also deteriorated, exposing occupants to danger. District Chief Executive for Doma East, Emmanuel Ajiman, said although funding is a challenge, the Assembly is prepared to support community-initiated projects. It's not possible that the Assembly can capture all those schools, but what we are paying so much attention to is the self-help, so that when the communities do something, if we have somebody somewhere who would want to support in any way, then the Assembly will also give the um, support that uh, it can afford. At Kremokrum, enrollment, I'm told, had dwindled, but teachers say they are doing their best to retain the rest. The declined enrollment was partly attributed to the irregular school feeding program. The parents know that when they come here, they will get food to eat. Unfortunately, when they, sometimes when they come, they don't get the food. So you see the children, uh, they're sitting down quietly. Or if you ask the person, you say, oh, I am sick, but as a teacher, we know that they are not sick, actually they are hungry. The following day, you see that the children didn't come to school, they don't come to school. District Education Director Joseph Amwamensa is worried the Education Directorate was not involved in the school feeding program. We, the managers of the educational institutions, we are, we are left in the, in the, in the, in the entire system of uh, school feeding. You don't know who the caterer is. You don't know when he's giving what. And so if you pop your nose much into it, sometimes you get the displeasure of some big men. Uh -huh. So uh, I should think that it's time we are roped into the system so that we all monitor what goes on. Kamokrom Basic School, like other schools in rural Ghana, would need stakeholder support to improve. Ghana Psychological Association is calling for more involvement of psychologists in the educational sector. Now, the association is of the view their contribution from policy implementation will aid the proper development of children, even those with special needs, to reach their full potential. This year's Ghana Psychological Association Public Lecture, an annual general meeting focused on attaining quality education by untying the naughty issues. President of the association, Dr. Erica Dixon, noted the skills of psychologists can be harnessed in supporting the education sector in arriving at some scientifically informed policies. A counselling psychologist and principal of the Commenda College of Education, Reverend Dr. Kwesi Inkum Wilson, expressed concern about the country's curricula, which has been unresponsive to needs such as critical mindedness. It's the creativity, the critical thinking, which at this stage is lacking. Nationwide teachers are being trained on their new curriculum, and much emphasis is placed on critical thinking. They're changing the 
mode of assessment. And I believe that is where I'm talking about teacher education. Teachers coming out of our colleges of education should be retrained. Head of Psychology Department, University of Ghana, Professor Joseph Osafo, called for attention to be given to the psychological aspect of teacher education. About 1,300 students in schools in Accra, and one in every four is cutting herself or himself. One in every five has attempted suicide. Now, this is only in Greater Accra. We are putting together a school psychology program. And we think that the Minister, Minister of Education should pick up this. Deputy Minister of Education in charge of Technical Vocational Education and Training, Tivet, Gifty Chum Ampofo, admonished researchers to undertake studies which will inform policies in the educational sector. We wish that they direct their students into research that will benefit the educational sector, our preschool, our basic school, including the SHS to ensure that we're doing the right things. All right, from that story, the Governing Council of the Gotime Kente Festival is pushing for legislation to make the festival a national one. The Paramount Chief of Gotime Traditional Area, Nenenue Teteku, made the call at the 2019 Annual Gotime Kente Festival at Spetoy in the Volta region. Kente is a ceremonial cloth which is hand woven. It is a visual representation of our history, philosophy, ethics, oral literature, religious beliefs and political thoughts. Since 2005, the Kente Festival has been celebrated to showcase the uniqueness of the cloth as an indigenous fabric from Ghana. The festival also seeks to draw attention to the aesthetic and cultural values of the cloth. The festival brought together indigenous and tourists. A member of the planning committee Elvis Ativa, who read a speech read on behalf of the paramount chief of Agotime traditional area, Nene Nua Keteku, appealed to government for a legislation to make the festival a national one. The, the motives, motives and, and patterns reveal a wealth of information about, about our, our history, history about, about our, our cultural, cultural practices, philosophy, philosophy and, and religious beliefs. beliefs. It is, it is important, important that, that we, we protect, protect and, and preserve this heirloom heritage. heritage. Volta Regional Minister Dr. Archibald Yao Lecha pledged the preparedness of the Coordinating Council to support setting up of a Kinte factory. I would therefore entreat all the players in the Kinte industry to take advantage of government's intervention immediately as they are rolled out. I will also urge the experienced Kente weavers in the country to assume the responsibility of training the youth in the art so as to ensure the availability of skilled workforce in the industry. This year's festival was on the theme Attitudinal Change, the panacea for a future development. The media for the support of the government. This year's festival has and out of healthcare, the University of Ghana Medical Center, UGMC, has set November this year to fully open the hospital to the general public. The center currently runs only three OPD clinics, including pediatric clinics, the OPS, and gynecology. The University of Ghana Medical Center has not been fully operational since it was opened a year ago. The facility was in the news following its delayed opening by the Ministry of Health and University Authorities. But the Director of University of Ghana Medical Center, Stimulation and Training Center, Professor Aaron Lawson, says the facility will now be fully opened to the general public in November. The 1st of November, the place will be fully set up for, for training. But we, are, we, we have an arrangement with uh, some people from the American Heart uh, Association Foundation, they will be coming in September to uh, train in cardiopulmonary resuscitation. But for a new hospital of this caliber, you need to go about things uh, slowly and pick at the appropriate time. You know, 
you know, so patients have been trickling in. He added that prior to that, there will be a training on cardiopulmonary resuscitation in September where officials from the American Heart Association will train staff of the UGMC on how to handle cardiac arrest cases. The undergraduate students who come from the College of Health Sciences in the University of Ghana and then also undergraduate students from other health training institutions. We have two, currently two private medical schools who are ready to come and uh, benefit from the simulation center. And then also nursing training institutions across the, uh, across the country. University of Ghana Medical Center was completed in 2016 by former President Mahama, but generated controversy after the current administration delayed in opening it to the public, citing a number of reasons, including inadequate staffing. Public relations officer of the center, Barbara Owusu Hemin, however, says the hospital is operational. The, a lot has been happening behind the scenes over the past 12 months. There has been the successful negotiation between the government of Ghana and the University of Ghana in terms of um, an acceptable ownership arrangement. We have three of our OPD clinics running, namely the pediatric clinic, the OPS and gynae. Therefore, we actually handle antenatal cases and um, deliveries and postnatal services as well. A tour of the facility saw some patients receiving treatment in OPS and gynecology clinic. Joseph Armstrong, TV3 News, Accra. You're still watching Media Live. We'll be back shortly. Thanks for staying. You're still watching Midday Live. Let's focus on health. And the Director General of the Ghana Health Service, Dr. Nsia Asari, says he was misquoted as saying the service was going to ban the use of mobile phones by health workers. He indicated the service is rather considering banning mobile phone use unrelated to the duty of health workers. The Director General was reacting to reports on the ban on the use of mobile phone by health workers in the Japa district, which has met stable position by the Upper West Region branch of the Ghana Registered Nurses and Midwives Association. The group, in a release, indicated that the directive was ill prepared as the appropriate background preparations for a smooth takeoff hasn't been done. Speaking on the sidelines of the launch of the GEP app in Accra, Dr. Nsiasari noted communication was key for health workers and he would not take such a decision. So we are using a lot of what you call the mobile health, M health. We have not going to ban that one. But we are going to ban when people are sitting down, when they are seeing patients and they are on mobile phone because I don't believe that you will take any doctor or anybody serious or any nurse serious when he is attending to you and he's talking to Kojumans and Kojunet to say, oh, a high enemy, be a camera, oh, me here, Juma. It's not what we are supposed to do. He expressed disappointment over situations where some health workers record and post documents of sick persons with their phones. You know, smartphones, you can take pictures at any time, and then you take somebody's picture while he's sick, you haven't uh, sought the person's consent, and then you send it out. Sometimes you see sick people whose uh, documents have been sent out. It's not acceptable. So that is the reason why I said it, and I said that, and we mean it. The General indicated that the health service was considering an intercom system to curb the use of phones by health workers in line of duty. We also are also going to put in place, with the help of the telcos, also intercommunication system. We have a very strong intercommunication system. You not even use your mobile phone for anything, because you know that you pick a phone, a line phone within, which is interconnected, and then you call. Still on healthcare, and an app, Global Epidemic Prevention Project, has been introduced in Accra to help Ghana prevent the transmission of infectious diseases. The app, which is to strengthen the disease surveillance and secure global health, is a collaboration between the Ghana Health Service and Korea Telecom. The introduction of the GEP app is an addition to existing apps in the health sector. It alerts users on potential threats and provides the nearest hospital information. 
The app operates by informing the Ghana Health Service of travelers to epidemic-prone countries or local areas. To use this app also to educate the general population. So anybody who is on the app, if you want to travel to any part of this country or outside the country, you go on the app and look at the region where you are going or the country you are going to tell you all the types of if there are any epidemics there. Key stakeholders in the health sector also loaded the new app. The implementation of the GEP app is as a result of an MOU last year between Korea Telecom and the Ghana Health Service. The World Food Program is partnering the Ghana Health Service to fight malnutrition and stunting in children. The World Health Organization defines stunting as impaired growth and development that children experience from poor nutrition, repeated infections and inadequate psychological stimulation. According to the 2014 Ghana Demographic and Health Survey report, various forms of undernutrition have reduced considerably, with a prevalence of underweight at 13%. According to the Ghana Health Service, one in every five children in Ghana is stunted. Today we are saying that we want to invest uh, and develop the human capital. We cannot do that effectively if close to 20% of our children are stunted. Um, at the individual level, um, it means the child is also not thriving well and it shows in school attendance and performance. To help reduce malnutrition and stunting in children, the World Food Programme, with support from the Japanese government, has launched a project for addressing malnutrition at Pakoso in Asokari Mampon municipality. Country director of the World Food Programme, Rukia Yakub, said the WFP's country strategic plan for Ghana for 2019 to 2023 is to support efforts to achieve zero hunger by 2030. The cost of hunger study that Ghana conducted two, three years ago reveals that 37% of the adult population suffered from stunting as children and the annual cost associated with child and nutrition costs the nation 6.4% as its GDP. These figures make it quite clear that eliminating stunting in Ghana is a necessary step for sustainable development. A representative of Coco Plus Foundation reiterated the commitment of the foundation to help fight malnutrition in children. More on health care and over 300 individuals in and around Kwashiman in the Gasalth municipality of the Greater Accra region received drugs and medical equipment after they were diagnosed of various diseases including malaria. Consultant and gynecologist at the Kolibu Teaching Hospital, Dr. Theodore Boafo, advised Ghanaians to seek regular health checkups for a healthy life. The event was organized as part of the church's 50th anniversary celebration to assist especially the vulnerable in the metropolis who are unable to access health care. Over 300 individuals received drugs after they were diagnosed with various diseases. Some participants also donated blood to support those in need at the various hospitals. Consultant and gynecologist at the Kolibu Teaching Hospital, Dr. Theodore Boafu, urged the public to develop the attitude of kindness through blood donation. Half yearly, we should go to donate blood for, uh, for, by the church so that um, we can at least supply blood to I mean, some of the hospitals. Blood donation is what will save a lot of people's lives. We should all take up blood donation as something that is good. Blood donation really, really saves people's lives. If you ever seen somebody dying because there's no blood, it is sad. Principal nursing officer at the Kolebu Teaching Hospital, Eunice Jassa, entreated women to seek regular breast cancer treatment. For her part, Associate Pastor of the Church, Reverend Vida Agbu, noted the church will continue to support members of the area through health care and other means. We've been doing health bazaar for church members and people around. It's according to the Bible, 3 John 1. Uh, Paul said it's his desire that we stay in good health. So it's a wholeness kind of thing. After teaching the person the Bible, 
we get into what the, the responsibilities of the person also, which is physically what we have to do. So we go through distance and then get members informed about some of the diseases. So it's through this kind of exercise, some of them are able to detect things they didn't even know. Some more stories this afternoon. Nestle Ghana and the University of Ghana have signed a memorandum of understanding to collaborate in the skills and research exchange. The MOU is expected to form part of Nestle's commitment to youth development. The Memorandum of Understanding is a two-year renewable agreement between the food and beverage company and the University of Ghana, Lagon. It will offer practical learning opportunities to enhance nutrition, science and technology. Managing Director of Nestle Ghana, Philomena Tang, is optimistic. The move is at the core of bringing to life Nestle's purpose of enhancing quality of life and contributing to a healthier future. Today's uh, partnership with the University of Ghana is because both of us actually believe in youth development and uh, we have strong interest in it, both of us. So this is an opportunity for us to come together to work in that direction, in that sense. The Pro Vice Chancellor, Students and Academic Affairs of the University of Ghana, Professor Samuel Kwame Ofei, believes the partnership will provide students with experiential learning and industry opportunities. We are going to benefit by collaborating with an industry which has facilities and opportunities for faculty and students to enhance their skills and also to develop their research uh, potentials. The MOU is one of the many activities that form part of Nestle's Global Youth Initiative, which aims at helping 10 million young people have access to economic opportunities by 2030. Time now for international news and a bomb has exploded in a wedding hall in the Afghan capital, Kabul, killing 63 people and wounding more than 180. Witnesses said a suicide bomber detonated explosive during a wedding ceremony. Now the explosion happened at around 18.10 GMT in the area in the west of the city, mostly populated by Shia Muslims. Now, the Taliban denied they were behind the attack and no other group has admitted carrying out the bombing. Sunni Muslim militants, including the Taliban and Islamic State group, have repeatedly targeted the Shia Gaza minorities in Afghanistan and Pakistan. The Afghan Interior Ministry confirmed the death toll hours after the bombing. Afghan weddings often include hundreds of guests who gather in large halls where men are usually segregated from women and children. So another international story and tens of thousands of pro-democracy campaigners have gathered in Hong Kong and for another day of protest amid increasing severe warnings by the Beijing government. A march on Saturday was peaceful, but demonstrators and police have clashed frequently over the past 10 weeks. The protesters were sparked and an extradition bill in relation to that which has since been suspended by the Hong Kong government. And China has condemned the unrest as a behavior that is close to terrorism. That's all for international news. Next, we have entertainment news. And entertainment this afternoon, Kuma Uda actor and tourism ambassador Bill Asamoa has set the falling standards in the movie industry in Ghana is as a result of the failure to utilize modern day technology. According to him, the industry has the potential to do better if the needed measures are put in place. He spoke to our reporter, Naftali Ba. It's more like a renaissance for us now. It's more like um, a change, a wind of change that is blowing and that uh, we would have to adapt ourselves with the current situation. The Ghana movie industry once upon a time was booming with massive gains in sales. But that deadly has changed. Yeah, I've been going around with this guy. I was born in Accra. You born in Accra? Accra. I die, I'm in 
Critics have blamed the falling standards on producers and on foreign telenovelas. But Kumawood actor Biola Sama thinks the industry's inability to make use of modern day technological advancement is the problem. Can you imagine five years ago when America and Co were on Blu ray? We were also glorifying ourselves in video CD. Video CD was a cake, video CD was dead and gone, but that was what we were doing, you understand? So now that they've moved from CDs, they are now on Netflix and all that, we are now struggling to be on the internet. But tourism ambassador is optimistic that the movie industry could bounce back if the needed measures are put in place. We will learn our lessons and I will kind of move with time now because um, everything is now internet, the theaters, and then you don't get people buying CDs no more. We need to get systems in place so we get seasoned distribution houses to help us. When we talk about the internet, it's not about Ghana, it's not about Africa, it's about the whole world. So we need distributors who can promote our movies out there. And then we need television stations who can equally accept our movies and pay good money for us. Not those who will just come and then beg and then take your movies and show it for free. No. The trend is changing. The time is changing. So we we'll have to also do the same. For 24 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> hey, 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 post. More strategy. I'm going to see the end. So we work it, sir. When we back to what? And that'll be all for this afternoon. I am Wendy Lai. Have a lovely Sunday afternoon. Enjoy the rest of our programs. News 360 is at 7.